focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters, Yu Min and Che Jae-hee. Guys, welcome back to the studio. Good, Good evening, evening. Esther. All right, uh, we're going to start things off on uh, national politics uh, here in the country. We have about uh, two weeks left, believe it or not, in the for the, uh, the inauguration of President-elect Yoon sa uh, We are seeing more and more movements being made. Uh, of course, uh, there's certainly a lot of changes, especially with the, uh, the moving of the presidential office. But now, uh, we're going to have a new presidential residence. Uh, it's been announced and confirmed earlier today that the foreign minister's residence has been selected as the new presidential residence. Uh, Chihi, let's get the details on that. Sure. So President-elect Yoon suk yeols spokesperson, Bae Hyun-jin, announced during a press briefing Sunday that the foreign minister's residence was picked as Yoon's official abode. Uh, former foreign ministers have resided in the area, and the incumbent foreign minister is also currently living in the place. Now, the transition committee initially considered moving to the residence of the Army Chief of Staff, but it was found to be unsuitable given its uh, condition and various other factors, and thus was ruled out from the options. Now, the Army Chief of Staff's residence was built in 1975 and was left vacant for quite a while, so greater time and cost were required to renovate the place so that the uh, incoming president can live in the place. Also, it was described as being too old and run down to accommodate the necessary security facilities for the president. Uh, meanwhile, the foreign minister's residence, one of six official ministerial residences in the Hanamdong area, is close to the defense ministry compound in Yongsan district, where the presidential office is due to be relocated. In fact, it's only 3.2 kilometers away from the president's new office in Yongsan. And also, the foreign minister's residence was regularly fixed and maintained, thus the renovation of the place is expected to take about a month after Yoon's inauguration, whereas the Army Chief of Staff's residence was expected to take about four to five months. And the premises of the foreign minister's residence are known to be the size of, size of, uh, of about two soccer fields, which is approximately 14,710 square meters and 1,434 square meters for just the building area. Uh, so the area was considered suitable in terms of security and uh, for the purposes of uh, reception of foreign guests. Now, during the month-long renovation period, Yoon plans to commute to the new presidential office in Yongsan, central Seoul, from his private home, which is located in Seocho District, just across the Han River. And uh, the renovation work on the residence will begin once the current foreign minister, Chong Yong, vacates the area on May 10th. While the president-elect commutes to his office from his private home for a month, Yoon's spokesperson explained that the commuting times of the people would be considered so that severe traffic problems are not caused due to the blocking of the roads for the presidential motorcade. Again, this is a, uh, a very unique situation mm-hmm. in that in, in most cases, in most countries, in most uh, presidential offices, you have the presidential residence within the presidential mm-hmm. yeah. uh, office. And so so having to commute and, you know, they do say 3.2 kilometers is it, it's close, but it could also be far in that, you know, during traffic time, rush hour, mm-hmm. uh, considering all the, the security that's involved with this, which is why uh, a lot of people have been very much against the idea of even moving the presidential office. But it does seem like it is going to go through nevertheless. Uh, but in the meantime, Prime Minister nominee's uh, confirmation hearing set to take place uh, soon. And of course, uh, it took place. It actually started off with some rough start and we did know that there was going to be some fierce, fierce oppositions uh, considering the fact that the prime minister position is something that needs to be going through the, the confirmation hearing through the parliament. We know that the parliament, the National Assembly, is still dominated by the DP. So, uh, Sumin, tell us about this. Where are we at right now? Well, just like you said, SJ, the parliamentary confirmation hearing for Prime Minister nominee Han duk Su was adjourned earlier today with fierce boycotting from the ruling Democratic Party and, of course, the minor Justice Party. Well, the reasons the two parties cited was of Han failing to provide requested data and documents by saying that it's useless to vet the Prime Minister nominee Han duk Su without the essential data present. Well, the hearing was uh, opened at 10 a.m. earlier today without the two parties and was subsequently 
subsequently suspended only 39 minutes afterwards. Well, the ruling and opposition parties were expected to seek an agreement on that matter before resuming the hearing at 2 p.m., but ultimately it was posted postponed again, and that will resume tomorrow at the same time at 10 a.m. Well, Representative Kang Byung-won, the DP senior member of the Special Hearing Committee, expressed strong regret that the main opposition People Power Party unilaterally began the hearing despite the DP's call to postpone it, while Song Il-jung, the PPP senior member, said in response that his party assesses the nominee to have been relatively sincere in responding to the document request, which of course included his parents' past real estate state dealings even. Well, Song urged the rival parties to attend the hearing to give the public an opportunity to evaluate the nominee's morality, expertise, and experience. So Prime Minister nominee Han dok Su is under allegations of alleged conflicts of interest related to his home rental back in 1990s and also the hefty salary he received as an advisor to law firm Kim and Chang. Well, here in South Korea, Prime Minister is actually the only cabinet post that requires parliamentary approval so since this is the first such confirmation hearing and that will pave the way for a future hearing. So eyes are on the process and the outcome of this confirmation hearings overall. Yeah, again, because the prime minister position is the only cabinet post that requires parliamentary approval. I mean, you saw what the human administration, administration did is, uh, you know, they chose someone who had previous, I guess, affiliation both with the liberal party and the conservative yeah, exactly. party. Uh, but on the flip side, what a lot of people were saying is because he was someone that kind of went from liberal party to the conservative party. And in some ways, it's kind of like, quote unquote, betraying mm. the former party. So he wasn't going to get kind of the same kind of approval that I think the UN administration had expected would get. And there was a you know clear cut reason as to why they chose uh, Han Dok-su as the prime minister, because they wanted yeah. some bipartisan support. Uh, but certainly doesn't seem like this at this time. And of course, with the real estate uh, issue being such a uh, highly contested issue uh, that is, of course, going to be raised. Uh, Anchar Su, the chief president-elect's uh, 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 transition team, uh, held the press briefing this afternoon to explain the future sources of income and jobs for the incoming administration. Uh, Ji, let's get the updates on that. Sure. So Anchar Su, uh, the chairman of Yun's transition committee, held a 30-minute long briefing this afternoon regarding the topic of the revitalization of new future industries for the country. Now, during the briefing, he introduced the term a negative regulation and explained that this new concept refers to a regulation that allows every act that is not banned by law or policy. Uh, he added that it is important to prevent new regulations from being developed without any restriction as uh, thoughtless, thoughtlessly implemented regulations often hinder business growth. An said, unlike the current Moon Jae-in administration, which focused its policies around an income-led growth paradigm, the Yoon administration will promote public and private growth based on the philosophy of a free market economy. Uh, he also explained the new administration will protect the three key principles of autonomy of businesses, a fair market, and the social safety net. And regarding the future sources of income and jobs, uh, Chairman An mentioned 6G, secondary battery, displays, bio, defense avi aviation, and space industry, as well as next generation nuclear energy, the hydrogen industry, a smart agriculture, AI, and cultural content. That's right. And uh, it's been long considered that these are going to be the future of what's going to be boosting the economy here in South Korea. Uh, we're going to be talking about some uh, politics and TV-related stuff. Mm. A lot of talks on this. Uh, President Moon Jae-in is going to be appearing on a TV interview later tonight uh, to, of course, mark the five year of his presidency. Uh, it is going to be aired for two days uh, starting tonight. Uh, Sumi, let's, let's uh, talk about what this is all about. Yeah, so there has been this immense buzz around this last public interview before President Moon Jae-in leaves office. So outgoing President Moon Jae-in and a renowned former JTBC anchor, Sun seok -ki, having this unprecedented one-on-one -on -one conversation. So it's going to be a pre-recorded interview titled Five Years of Moon Jae-in. So as the title pretty much encapsulates, the interview will focus on looking back on the major issues that have occurred during the five years of Moon Jae-in administration. So it's going to be hosted by former JTBC 
CCTVC journalist Sun Seok Ki, and he said that he will ask the questions solely based on journalistic perspective. So inevitably, Moon could have had some perplexing moments uh, touching upon his sore spot. Well, according to the JTBC production team, President Moon Jae-in answered candidly without evading questions, sometimes with silence and sometimes with some counter-arguments. Well, one interesting feature of the interview is the venue the show has chosen, the sceneries that you could see throughout the show. Well, it took place against the backdrop of the main building of Cheongwadae, the presidential office of Yeomingwan, Sangchinje, and Chimnyukak. And according to the Blue House, it's the first First and last time, the Chimnyugak Pavilion was used as a venue for Chongwadae events. So as we know, President Moon Jae-in will historically remain as the last president of the so-called Chongwadae era. So this interview pretty much put that on the record. So the two-part show will be broadcast on the cable channel JTBC tonight, and they will run through. Uh, they will also be aired to, uh, tomorrow night from 8:50 p.m. for about 80 minutes and as the president and former uncle will meet for the for the first time in five years since the presidential candidate debate held in april 2017 special eyes are on what this quite a lengthy conversation will entail and what we could get out of this dense in-depth conversation yeah you know it's going to be an interesting interview but uh to be perfectly honest i i, I don't think it's going to be the last of the chongwade era I, I really feel like there's going to be some next president uh, who will return to Taiwan. Who's going to say, well, you know, we're going to go back to what South Korea yeah, is all that about. that is a possibility. And then <laughs> Chung- Chung- Day, we're going to return back to Taiwan. And they're going to say, we want to kind of get rid of the, the you know, what the, the UN administration's, uh, you know, symbol in the old defense ministry and so forth. And all that stuff is going to happen. Uh, but then, nevertheless, I still think. That another interesting that's, uh, thing that's going to come out with the uh, television show that we're talking about is the show called You Kids on the Block. Mm-hmm. Now, it is very popular because, number one, uh, it is hosted by arguably probably the, one of the most popular yeah. mm-hmm. um, you know, MCs or a host TV host uh, in, in all of Korea, Yoo Jae Suk. Apparently, incoming president Yoon Suk Yeol uh, is going to be appearing on this, uh, and of course, uh, he, appeared oh, he already that. appeared yeah, on yeah, this. And, um, there was a lot of mixed reviews mm-hmm. uh, into whether or not he should have been part of this show. Uh, he shouldn't have back and forth, and some of the statements in regards to how Yoo Jae Suk kind of. Um, responded to him appearing on the show and so forth. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about this, Sumin. Yeah, there were indeed mixed reviews. There were criticisms against both the cable network and, of course, the president-elect Yoon sung yeol At the same time, there were positive comments backing the president-elect Yoon sung yeol So just to give you some a little bit of a background about this show, it's hosted by the renowned popular comedian duo Yoo jae Seok and Chu Se-ho. And the episode featuring Yoon sung yeol invited four guests to this week's episode and nearly 20 minutes of the 100-minute talk show were dedicated to President-elect Yoon sung yeol and he mostly reminisced about his past as a prosecutor, his feelings about being elected as the president, and also he talked about his recent daily lives. Now, there were over 14,000 related posts on the show's website about Yoon's appearance, and if you take a look at this, the arguments from those who were, you know, annoyed or bothered by Yoon's appearance, they said that the very fact that the production team invited the powerful politician onto the show. The president-elect uh, onto the show does not really align with the very purpose of that TV show because it's basically geared toward delivering stories about the ordinary people. And the comments also said that it allows President-elect Yoon sung yeol to use the popular show politically to create a favorable, favorable image of him and his party to the public with the local election coming up pretty soon. And there were also some critical comments toward the two hosts on the show's website by saying that it lacked a much-needed humor or natural conversation or some substance. But on the opposite side, some have shown support for Yoon and the show, saying that people are making too big of a deal about Yoon's appearance because he previously appeared on shows like All the Butlers, Chip Sabulche, or Problem Child in the House while he was running as the presidential candidate, along with some other politicians like former uh, rival Lee Jae-myung, and that show projected more of a friendly and approachable side of him. So th- there are obviously some mixed reviews regarding this. Yeah, you know, I think the big difference uh, between that, and I did see some of these, one of my favorite uh, television shows where a whole bunch of candidates appear was Saturday Night Live, right? Uh, right? Uh, you ah. have the, 
You had the uh, the mock reporter mm-hmm. uh, who's supposed to be this very amateur in their 20s uh, and then asking all these weird questions to the candidates. I, I think the difference is in all the shows that you just talked about is you're talking about a candidate mm-hmm. as opposed to someone who is soon to become the next president. And so what a lot of people were arguing was that now, I don't know what television station uh, you kids on the block is, but now are they lining up uh, to kind of be on the Yoon side, right? Because apparently uh, the report that came out was that the uni- uh, the Moon Jae-in administration's people also contacted uh, you kids on the block saying that, you know, they're interested in coming out, but they said no. And so now are they saying, all right, so is this politically motivated? Another thing was Yu Jae Suk was apparently uh, not, I guess, alerted ahead of time that mm-hmm. uh, Yoon Sung Yar was going to be coming out as a guest, and he made it clear that he did not want any politician, not to show, not because he didn't necessarily like like Yoon Sung Yar or even like Moon Jae In. He just said no politicians on the show was what he had hoped for, mm-hmm. but uh, obviously not the case here. But I want to get your thoughts on, you know. Presidents, politicians uh, appearing on this reality TV programs. Do you like it or are you against uh, against, uh, the idea of it? Let's start off with you, Chi. Well, it could really be a double-edged sword. Um, I mean, they're all coming out on TV to improve their political image, of course. But it could turn out the other way if they make a mistake or if they receive criticism from the viewers. But... Uh, The pure act of appearing on TV, I'm not really against it, but regarding this case uh, of President-elect Yoon Yoon Seok-yeol appearing on You Quiz on the Block, I think that's a different story, like you said. Um, He's the first president-elect to be appearing on an entertainment show like this, right? And the purpose of um, this particular program is to feature ordinary people who are living their lives like on uh, their part. Uh, and having President-elect Yoon seok on the show is really against their purpose. And it could be seen as uh, a, a use, using of the TV program for political purposes. So in this case, I'm, I don't think it was a very wise choice to appear in this particular program. But regarding the overall just appearance of political uh, figures on TV, I'm not really against that because that could uh, have a positive effect of um, getting closer to the people. Uh, they may seem more friendly and people may have a chance to see the other side of these people, uh, the politicians. But regarding this case, uh, appearing on programs such as UQuiz and for president-elect appearing on the program. I don't think it was such a wide choice. Yeah, and also I'm kind of bitter because uh, you kids on the blog kind of rejected my request to be on the show. Um, so that <laughs> for could real? be... real? Really? I, I did because they were really? looking for ordinary people. <laughs> for what? Oh. <laughs> ordinary people with interesting life stories. And so I thought I was uh, eligible for that, but apparently I wasn't, uh, you know, I guess interesting enough. But yeah, I, I think it's more the timing of it. I yeah. think if Yoon Sung Yar... Uh, appeared on the show before um, he got elected not even before after you know he's the president maybe like months into his presidency mm. it would have been okay because why What's oh, the, the, oh it's the just the timing though. of it because you're saying that a president like as soon as now that we know or the television station knows that he is going to be the president uh-huh. let's line up to him oh. right it's like oh we got to be on his good side uh people could kind of think that way and especially because I think a lot of broadcast stations are now kind of being cautious over some of the things that you say or is being done, uh, catering to what the next administration is going to be. So because it is such a sensitive timing right now, um, I honestly would have loved to see him on this show uh, if it was like months into it. I, I actually even enjoyed when, you know, former President Park Geun-hye came out in healing camp. I think she kind of wanted to show her... The other side of things, mm. uh, the person that people saw behind the scenes of the, you know, being a president and so forth. But that was during the administration, which I thought was good. Uh, Sumin, what about yourself? Uh, what do you think about, uh, I guess, presidents or politicians appearing on these shows? Well, I'm basically with Chihi. I'm not going to comment on President like Yoon seung appearance on the UK on the blog specifically, but overall, generally, politicians appearing on the reality TV shows or talk shows. I think they, them appearing on talk shows or reality TV programs are quite generally strategic because their appearance could be for PR and communication purposes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's to revamp their personal image. And, but also, always there's this risk of being slammed for one single behavior, mm-hmm. one comment that, uh, that they make when they appear on TV. So I think uh, 
uh, they also runs this re- risk of PR crisis. So I generally think the uh, they appearing on YouTube channels or reality programs pretty much reflects the new and modern way of shaping the politician's image and people's content consumption behavior. Because I mean, a lot of businesses, politicians tend to utilize social media platforms mm-hmm. in a very refreshing kind of way, very innovative, engaging, friendly ways, such as like the presidential campaign. And quite honestly, I think it really depends on the politician's capability to kind of project a great enhanced image of himself and deliver clear message through this TV program. And if you think about it, many politicians have appeared on various TV talk shows, like SJ had said, not just on the U quiz on the block, but another TV programs like Tipsa Buriche or Dong Sang Imun, I believe it was, Lee Jae Myung when he was the Songnam City Mayor, and uh, Na Kyung Won, Park Young Sun when they were. Uh, uh, running for the Seoul mayor, Seoul mayor re-election. They appeared on another TV program like Ane Mat. And I actually watched most of these episodes and I personally saw a more friendly side of them. So I think we should not necessarily ban or criticize the very act of appearing on the TV talk show. We can comment or criticize or critique on their behaviors, remarks they make. So the bottom line is critique the message, not the platform. Again, I am very much for mm. uh, politicians and presidents uh, being on these shows because you're absolutely right. We live in a completely different era yeah. where I think, you know, you seeing, and who knows, I, you know, Yoon Sung Yar could be a very fun person, uh, <laughs> you know, and th- those are the things that I think people want to see, right? Yeah. And especially where you're also trying to target some of the, uh, the younger age group. But it's just, again, I've always enjoyed seeing politicians, even in the United States, right? Uh, you know, I would have, I know, uh, what is it, uh, you know, former President Barack Obama has come out. Was it the Jim, Jimmy Kimmel show? I think he came out once. Really? Uh, things like that, where he did the, the top 10. Uh, it was all fun stuff, and I really enjoy it, but it's just the timing of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I when see ev- your point. Yeah, when mm-hmm. everything is so sensitive right now, I think it's just. Um, they could have, I think the producers or, you know, whoever the head of uh, the, the station could have done a better job in timing of it, maybe after he became president and uh, sometime later on, just before when he's president, like at this time, I think it was a little bit sensitive. Mm-hmm. And also, I mean, you just, you know, you, we, one of the things that we always say is he's, he's never had any antis, right? You know, everyone's <laughs> a fan of you, just, yeah. but there's a lot of <laughs> uproar that he's getting. And I don't think, you know, he was upset because he was not necessarily, you know, didn't agree with Yoon's ideas or policies or anything like that. I think he was just really upset that the producers didn't tell him ahead of time yeah. that this was going to happen. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's going to be interesting. We'll see which one has the higher viewer rating. Uh, you Kids on the Block or this JTBC oh, interview, right? That's interesting. another thing that people are looking into. <laughs> uh, also, another thing that we've been watching very closely is all the action uh, with uh, North Korea. Defense experts have widely speculated about the high possibility of a military parade in North Korea. This, of course, to mark their key national anniversary. Uh, no signs of such activities being reported as of today. Uh, Ji, what's the latest? Right. So many had predicted that a military parade will take place at midnight uh, on the occasion of North Korea's 90th founding anniversary of the Korean People's Revolutionary Army, which is today. Uh, and satellite images showed the North's apparent preparations that involved thousands of troops and key military equipment to hold a street parade at the Kim Il-sung Square in Pyongyang. Uh, And some said the parade might have been delayed due to the weather or other uh, possible conditions. Mm. And North Korean state media, including the official Korean Central News Agency, reported on the anniversary without mentioning uh, the holding of the military parade early this morning. And according to state media, a photo exhibition was held to highlight the achievements of the KPRA to celebrate the anniversary. Uh, And as the North usually celebrates every fifth and tenth political anniversaries on a greater scale, many still expect it to hold a military parade to deliver a message to its people and the international community and to foster internal uh, unity. And this could possibly take place tonight at midnight. That's what Mm. experts say. Yeah. And again, I mean, the reason why we watch uh, very closely at these military parades is oftentimes they do showcase new weapons. Uh, And so which is why we're watching this 
uh, very kind of, well, we'll see what happens. Uh, it, it is highly speculated that uh, it is going to happen, nevertheless. Uh, in the meantime, South Korean President like Yoon Sung Yar's delegation uh, to Japan, of course, arrived in Tokyo yesterday, had talks with Japan's top diplomat earlier today. Uh, they're planning to meet with a host of senior officials, government officials, and business people. Uh, you have the details on this, Sumin. Yeah, so with just two weeks left until the presidential pres, uh, incoming president's inauguration, the seven-member delegation led by Representative Chung jin Seok of Yoon's Conservative People Power Party arrived in Tokyo yesterday for a five-day stay. Now, the delegation carried a letter from President-elect Yoon song yeol that basically outlines his will for new relations with Japan, reiterating the importance of restoring relations after years of frayed bilateral relations. The delegation is also expected to meet with Kishida, Prime Minister Kishida, on Wednesday and hand him the letter. Well, the delegates met with Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi earlier in the day, and Chong told reporters that the two sides agreed to reach a conclusion on pending bilateral issues, apparently referring to long-time disputes, including those concerning Korean victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery, through sincere dialogue. Well, National Assembly Deputy Speaker Chong jin so also said that the call for increased cooperation derives from the two nations' shared view of a free democracy and market economy, as well as corresponding future tasks. But Chung jin Seok, however, said that his delegation is not seeking a resolution to these issues this time around, but rather, they're visiting Tokyo to explain Yoon's policy direction concerning bilateral relations. Also, Yoon's team did not really specifically raise the proposal related to high-profile issues like the wartime forced labor issue or export curbs, discharge of radio active water from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant. But wide-ranging discussions to possibly resume travels between South Korea and Japan, in-person exchanges were held, but high expectations that the visa-free entry process or the flight routes between Kimpo or Haneda could be resumed in the near future. Yeah, again, I mean, the UN administration really wants to improve uh, relations with uh, Japan. So yeah. uh, I'm sure in their first kind of meeting, uh, official meeting, they're not going to be raising some of the uh, very highly sensitive mm. issues uh, that's going to probably push them away further. But uh, I mean, it, it's it's one of those topics that gonna, they're going to have to face somehow. And that's it's how true. it's how the UN administration is going to deal with this later on. Uh, we will, of course, uh, get a full on detail of the Japan. Uh, it's a South Korea Japan relations moving forward in the incoming UN administration with Professor uh, Robert Kelly joining us uh, later on the program. So stick around for that. Uh, in the meantime, Prime Minister Kishida, uh, big question whether or not he'll be attending the upcoming inauguration ceremony for Yoon Sung Yar. Uh, do we know anything so far, Samin? Well, Chung Jin Seok, the representative, was asked about whether you, about this issue of Yoon inviting Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida to his May 10th inauguration event. Well, he said that Tokyo will have to make the decision on Kishida's attendance. So this particular issue is expected to be discussed during their meeting with Prime Minister Kishida scheduled on Wednesday. So if that's really realized, the incumbent Japanese Prime Minister will be attending the inauguration ceremony for the first time in 14 years after the inauguration of former President Lee myung bak back in 2008. Well, that also means a bilateral summit could be held if Kishida attends because former presidents Do Tae-woo, Do Mu-hyun, and Lee myung bak held bilateral summits on that occasion. But considering these current frayed relations between South Korea and Japan, there has been this majority of wide speculations that Kishida's attendance won't be an easy feat. But the delegation is also reportedly pushing for meetings with former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Yoshihide Suga as well. Yeah, which is why all the more they're not going to be bringing up the, uh, you know, the, the highly contested issues, mm. uh, the delegation and their visit to Tokyo, right? Uh, also, a senior White House official is in Seoul uh, to discuss the preparations for a possible summit between U.S. President Joe Biden and his soon-to-be South Korean counterpart, Yoon sung yeol uh, Ji Hee, you have details on this. Mm-hmm. So, according to diplomatic sources, Sources. Edgard Kagan, White House Senior Director for East Asia and Oceania at the National Security Council, came to Seoul on Saturday to hold meetings with the key members of President-elect Yoon suk yeols transition team uh, to discuss details for the summit between U.S. President Joe Biden and incoming President Yoon's summit, which is proposed for next month. Now, Biden is expected to visit South Korea before he travels to Japan for the Quad meeting 
being slated for May 24th, and he is likely to visit around May 20th or 22nd in between those days. And the details of the summit, including the exact schedule and the venue, are still being discussed. And as we've repeatedly said, uh, if the summit becomes finalized, it will become the earliest ever South Korea-U.S. summit to take place following the inauguration of a South Korean president. And it will also be the first Korea-U.S. summit to take place in Seoul right after the inauguration of a South Korean president. Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty big. I mean, again, the tradition was that the South Korean president visits Washington first. But Mm -hmm. if it's the other way around, certainly uh, some big changes we're seeing. You know, speaking of big changes we're seeing, uh, we're now pushing COVID-19 related issues all the way to the back of our segment, (laughs) which kind of shows you uh, where we're uh, shifted towards, right, in our daily lives. In in many ways, I think it's really good news. Uh, We are seeing definitely return to normalcy right now. South Korea is still seeing a decline in the number of cases, especially uh, earlier today, but we do still have to take into consideration the weekend effect of this. Nevertheless, uh, let's get some updates on this, Sumin. Yeah, so as you said, the daily new coronavirus cases dropped to the 30,000 today for the first time in 76 days as most of the country's virus-related restrictions are being lifted. So we are continuing this downward trajectory ever since reaching the peak over a month ago. We added 34,370 new infections, which brought the total caseload to 16,929,564. Now, the total death toll from COVID-19 came to 22,243, which is up 110 from yesterday. Well, the number of critically ill patients came to 668, which is down 53 from day earlier. Well, on the vaccination front, well, approximately 64.4% had received their first COVID-19 booster shots, and over 830,000 people, or that's uh, 1.6%, of the South Korean population have received their second booster shots or a third a fourth shot across the country and nearly 90% of them were aged 60 and older. So in line with the guidance from health authorities basically expanding the rollout of second booster shots for people aged 60 and over, President Moon Jae-in and First Lady Kim Jong-suk earlier today received a second COVID-19 booster shot. Uh, you know, I, I heard something that was a little bit alarming in regards to COVID-19. I think that uh, we have haven't talked about mm-hmm. uh, on our program is I had a chance to uh, talk to uh, Dr. Alice uh, Tan earlier uh, this morning. And what she was saying is that we are seeing a lot of uh, children dying from COVID-19. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, we've only reported on the whole figure, right? Like 110 yeah. deaths mm-hmm. uh, being reported. But there was about since the Omicron something that she was saying that there was about 12 children who died uh, from COVID-19, which doesn't seem like a lot. Mm-hmm. But to us, that's a high, high figure. Right. And so, I, again, it's not being reported enough. I know we we're talking about how there was a high number of cases being reported amongst you know, adolescents and so forth. So which is why I think still uh, we can't be too lax right now because we don't know how things are going to sh- change uh, mm-hmm. with different, uh, you know, recombinant variants that are popping out with all the XEs and the XLs and the XMs. Uh, but still, the South Korean government downgraded the four-tier infectious disease level of COVID-19 from the highest class 1 to class 2 uh, this beginning today. Uh, also from today, people are allowed to have food indoors for multi-use facilities. Jihi, you have more on this? Right. So the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters said it adjusted the infection disease level for COVID-19 from the highest class 1 to class 2 from today uh, to manage the disease in accordance with the weakened virus wave. So the disease level has been downgraded for the first time in two years and three months. And the adjustment of the infectious disease level to class 2 will be implemented in phases over a four-week period. So once COVID-19's infectious uh, disease classification is downgraded, those infected will no longer be required to self-quarantine for seven days. And doctors don't have to immediately report a uh, positive testing of the virus. So with quarantine no longer being mandatory, COVID-19 patients can go to their nearest hospital or clinic to get treated instead of going to the designated hospitals. 
And the government's coverage for the expenses will also end, which means the patients will have to pay for their own treatment. And the adjustment will, however, uh, be implemented, like I said, within a phased period so that uh, there is lessened confusion at the medical yeah. site. And the government des- uh, designated the next four weeks from today a transition period uh, during which the current seven-day quarantine will still be maintained. And after this transition period ends, uh, which is around May 23rd, the government will start what's called the settlement period to actually implement the changes uh, equivalent to the class to infectious diseases. And from then on, COVID-19 patients will likely be able to continue their everyday lives without having to self-quarantine. Uh, however, the settlement period may be delayed if there are any like uh, virus, uh, new virus variants. And health authorities will also decide this week whether to lift the outdoor mask wearing mandate. And also starting today, people are allowed to eat fo- food inside movie theaters, uh, indoor sports facilities, even KTX trains and other public transportations. However, the consumption of food on city and town buses, the smaller buses mm. that run around the town, uh, they use to be they were actually banned even before the pandemic in Mm. terms of food consumption and that will still be banned and large retail chains and department stores can now set up food sampling booths as well yeah i was gonna Mm. say even before the pandemic i never really liked people eating on the buses they're really the smaller buses right Mm. it just just smells a little bit too much (laughs) to be honest with you uh but uh, nevertheless i mean we are definitely seeing uh major changes moving forth we're just hoping that moving forward there's not going to be any major variants uh, that are going to pop up and we'll continue to see a downtick in the cases. Well, I'm sure we'll see higher numbers come Tuesday and Wednesday, but still, if it's still manageable and hopefully uh, soon enough, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic will be a thing of the past. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for now. But guys, as always, thank you very much for your report and your insights on some of these issues. As always, stay safe and we'll see you guys again. See you. See you, again. you can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.